George and I met in October of 1994 on the station platform at Val Royal in Montreal. We had each made the trip from our homes in New Jersey and Pennsylvania in order to document the next to last days of Canadian National's suburban electrification. The oldest locomotives had just turned 80 years old, still in five days a week service on the line to De Montagne. We hit it off immediately, good for me because I got to bum one of the beds in George's motel room just a few hundred yards from the tracks. Over the next few years, we saw each other infrequently. We met up once at the Robert Mann Gallery in New York so we could shake O. Winston Link's hand in the days before elbow bumps, and in 2003 we took a day trip out to Renovo, PA, where the Pennsylvania Railroad had an enormous shops complex. Abandoned by the time of our visit, most of the empty buildings still stood, and I found a 200-pound gear from some huge machine dropped into the weeds. George helped me manhandle it into my car, and the gear sits in my yard as an ornament. In 2012, George invited me to go on a trip through Maryland, West Virginia, and Virginia, searching for remnants of the old Chesapeake and Ohio. I cannot remember now whether I had any qualms about spending a week in the car with someone I had barely traveled with before, but our first odyssey together that October very quickly proved our compatibility, so much so that on the last day out, George happily chased the Western Maryland Scenics train while I rode the cab of number 734 up the mountain and back. I also do not remember why it took until 2016 for us to decide to go to a Center for Railroad Photography and Art Conference together, but that April we put more than 2,000 miles on my Ford Focus wagon, driving to Lake Forest by way of Berea and Bellevue, Ohio, then an evening and a morning in Chicago, and on the way home the real fun began. Before this trip, as he had in 2012, George assembled a detailed itinerary, not only the places to go, but the time of day to get there to optimize the sun angles. In addition to printouts of photographer's ephemeris, directions from Google Maps and compu commuter and Amtrak schedules were applicable, the binder included Xeroxes of his slides made at locations that George had visited before. On his iPad, George saved dozens of images from Google Street View and from other photographers, past and present, to guide and inspire us. All of that research and that binder turned out to provide only the framework around which we would build our experiences. As George has said ever since, the trips take us. In 1994, two rail fans, each on his own quest to record something which soon would become history, met for the first time on a station platform in Montreal, and thereby hangs a tale. Little did they anticipate that in 2016, they and their baggage would be cheek by jowl in a small car for two weeks, turned loose, free to indulge their passion with nary a conflict. How is this possible, you ask? I answer, like-mindedness of purpose, common interests beyond railroading, and a fortuitous compatibility. Like-mindedness and open-mindedness make for a good fit. We get along really well. When I first suggested to Oren that we attend Conversations 2016, he was receptive. Then I began to think it might be a good idea to take some extra time to visit areas of railroad interest on our way out and back. As I am retired, time is not a big issue, but as Oren is still employed, I had to persuade him to take as many days as possible. Our four trips have ranged from 9 to 17 days each. I call them an experiment in sleep deprivation, up at before dawn, down after da dusk. <clears throat> when I conceived this project, the primary objective was to seek out railroad artifacts such as interlocking towers, calling towers, stations, railroad logos, and workers. In other words, those things that survived the downsizing of railroad infrastructure. In this pursuit, Or and I are of the same mind. I chose the locations, and there was never a conflict as they coincided with Oren's interests. The internet provided invaluable in my research. Each location is selected in advance, directions plotted to the smallest detail so that we waste no time in reaching a location. Even though it's an intensive schedule, it's still fun. As there are so many places to visit, these trips require a synergy. Oren drives, George navigates. I call Oren Mr. Polo, as he has an excellent sense of direction. These are not journeys either one of us would make alone, and I'm most fortunate in having a traveling companion possessed of a keen intelligence and, and an abiding curiosity. 
Although at the outset these journeys were intended to be all about railroads, our minds became open to other aspects of Americana, mainly those of architectural interest. One of the first instances of this was in DeKalb, Illinois, where our objective was an XCNW culling tower. Driving along the main street, Orrin glanced down a side street and spotted an interesting building which, after we went around the block, turned out to be an Egyptian theater, a most distinctive structure. We spent more than an hour on a tour of its interior. This would open our minds to the treasures of Americana, which we might have passed up on a headlong rush to the tracks. We became flexible, learning to balance our time between rails and buildings. As John Steinbeck wrote in Travels with Charlie, we do not take a trip, a trip takes us. As you will see in some of the human interest photos, Orrin is a gregarious fellow who can start a conversation with most any stranger, and we made new friends when we asked their permission to make a shot from their property. The pictures we're showing today represent but a fraction of what we have recorded. There's a lot out there if you know where to find it, and the adventure lies in discovering new places. What lies around the next curve? In 1914, the poet Carl Sandburg wrote of Chicago, Hog butcher for the world, tool maker, stacker of wheat, player with railroads and the nation's freight handler, stormy, husky, brawling, city of the big shoulders. The stockyards are long gone, but Chicago is still the biggest player in American railroading, a place where one can find lots of intact historic railroad infrastructure in the form of stations, interlocking towers, fallen flag logos, plus a huge amount of freight and commuter traffic. To say that a railroad map of it resembles a spider web is no exaggeration, and its concentration of yards is second to none. As one who subscribes to the somewhat mythological ethos of the heartland, Chicago was a state of mind. If a fan were to make a list of what they wanted in urban railroading, they would have invented Chicago. It's a city justly famous for distinctive architecture, much of it visible from the CTA loop, a feature unique to this city. Because Chicago was on the Great Plains, with virtually unlimited visibility, a train can be photographed against the city skyline miles distant. I'm hard-pressed to think of another city in which an interlocking tower can be juxtaposed against a city backdrop. Roosevelt Road, bridging Amtrak, Metra's former Pennsylvania, Burlington Northern, and Rock Island lines, is a train watcher's paradise. With four major downtown stations, first Union, serving Amtrak, Metro's former CB&Q and Milwaukee Road lines, second LaSalle Street, serving Metro's former Rock Island, third Ogilvy Transportation Center, which is the former CNNW station, and fourth Millennium, serving the former Illinois Central Electrified and the South Shoreline. There's plenty of variety for platform buffs. In addition, Dearborn Station has been preserved as a market. These lines radiate in multiple directions, and the suburbs have a number of interesting stations. Diamonds may be a girl's best friend, but in Chicago, they are a rail fan's best friend, with multiple crossings within the city limits rivaling Prostoria, Ohio's Iron Triangle. Traces of fallen flags can be found at the Cermak Road overpass, on which the Rock Island and New York Central proudly cast their names in concrete, perhaps never anticipating their demise. We have now made three trips to Chicago and have only begun to plumb its depths, discovering new locations with each visit. Until just a very few years ago, I would never have made photos like any of the ones you see here, and not only because I grew up shooting ASA 125 and 400 black and white print film. I grew up in the Bronx and did all of my childhood rail fanning with my father. We spent thousands of hours along the Hudson Division in our neighborhood watching trains, but we took very few photos. We occasionally went out to New Jersey to photograph GG1s, or the even older Lackawanna electric cars, and we made some lengthy trips together in the 1970s, as far as northern Quebec, Detroit, and North Carolina, 
but on all of them we searched for steam, and we took almost no notice of the Class I railroads and Amtrak and the commuter lines. And trolleys and subways and elevated lines? No way. We loved steam locomotives, and we paid very little attention to everything else that made up railroading, including all of the once universal buildings and hardware that have since vanished, from signals and interlocking towers to pole lines. And I have to admit that I have done very little in recent years to document much of the remains in the area where I live, in central Pennsylvania. But when George and I hit the road, we go to new places, and we find the things that he has identified as special, and his enthusiasm rubs off on me. Although I had always had some vague notion of diamond crossings as interesting, I never paid them much mind. But after a visit to Faustoria, Ohio, home of the Iron Triangle and its 13 diamonds, down from something like 32 in the old days, I happily went back again and again and again. Likewise to Deschler, the crossroads of the Baltimore and Ohio, which only has two diamonds now, but a still somewhat healthy stand of B&O position light signals, another example of hardware that I would have overlooked in the past, but that, that now has the appeal of rarity. We show up ahead of the torch, and we look at everything, archaeologists on the prowl. The diamonds themselves have fascinating patterns. In some places, the tracks cross at 90 degrees. In other places, the custom-made forgings have to match the acute angles that 19th century surveyors drew across the flat Midwest landscape. In all of the examples here, the diamonds host fairly high-speed operations in all directions, and trains beat the hell out of the hardware. This makes diamonds highly maintenance-intensive. It also means that trains crossing them make noises unlike we hear elsewhere at trackside. Every wheel crossing each small gap makes a bang, and the faster the train, the louder the bang. The faster the train, the closer together the bangs, likewise with the length of the cars passing over the diamonds. 89-foot auto-rack cars coupled together go ba-bang, 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 ba-bang on a single-track diamond. Short covered hoppers for frac sand, however, crossing the double diamonds at Fostoria, go ba-bang, 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 an unbelievable noise, and, I must admit, an absolutely exhilarating one. At the west end of the Iron Triangle, a few houses sit not 50 feet from the diamonds, with dozens of trains shaking the ground day and night, day in and day out. Late one afternoon, in between trains, a man came out of one of the houses, and before he got in his car, I hailed him. I have to ask you, I said to him, what is it like living here with all of that noise? Oh, he said, we don't even notice it anymore. He drove away, and here came another train. Ba-bang, 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 ba-bang. What man-made structures of any kind remain standing for more than 60 years after they go out of use, the pyramids of Egypt come to mind. Other than stations, the most enduring railroad structures must be coaling towers. We're aware of 75 of them, and we know there are more. Some of the primary objectives of our odysseys were, and still are, coaling towers. These massive concrete structures have been obsolete for at least 60 years, rendered surplus by the demise of steam. By their very nature, so sturdily constructed of concrete, they still stand in no danger of collapsing, not an impediment to traffic, too expensive to demolish. For those which straddle main lines, their demolition would certainly disrupt traffic. Their designers and builders, most commonly Roberts and Schaefer of Chicago, which is still in business, are identified by colorful porcelainized steel signs. This is not a case of, if you've seen one, you've seen them all as there are, were many different designs with variations on angular monoliths, cylinders, and pyramids. A particular favorite is the former Nickel Plate Tower in Frankfort, Indiana, which we have visited three times. A large fading Nickel Plate logo is painted on it, and its resistance to the elements for so many decades is a testament to the durability of leaded paint. There was a time when railroads were proud to proclaim their identity, using free billboard space on company property. So there they stand, many of them in remarkably good condition, some with their rusting steelwork still attached, silhouetted against the sky. 
On the often treeless flatlands of the Midwest, they are visible from a distance, cleanly silhouetted, making ideal subjects at dawn and dusk. Thankfully, the railroads are not in a rush to destroy these relics. Diamonds remain quite common across the Midwest. Railroads aimed at every point of the compass still cross each other at grade. Much less common, though, trains running down city streets. Almost all main lines had separated rights-of-way through towns, and railroads have abandoned most of their industrial street trackage, surpassing rare anymore street trackage that hosts passenger trains. Thus the appeal of Michigan City, Indiana, 56 miles east of Chicago on the South Shore commuter line, where two miles of single track right in the middle of 10th and 11th streets see the passage of about 30 passenger trains a day to and from the loop, plus a few freights. The modern stainless steel equipment does not have the same personality as the heavyweight cars that ran here until the 1980s, and chanting jeeps do the freight work instead of Little Joe electric motors. But even the bi-level passenger cars bear orange and maroon heralds that pay homage to the South Shore's historic livery. The first trains came through in 1908, and except for the rolling stock, not much has changed. Back in 1990, on a trip west with my then-girlfriend and now wife, Sarah and I stopped in Michigan City so I could get a $5 haircut. But it did not occur to me then to look for the street running. I hadn't met George yet. He and I have gone to Michigan City on every one of our CRPA trips, spending more time on each succeeding one. In 2019, two evenings and two mornings in the heart of town, photographing all of the rush hour trains on a stretch of street measuring no more than a quarter mile in length. Between the houses, the abandoned church, the abandoned passenger station, the curves and hills in the street and track, and even the cars on the street and the pedestrians on the sidewalk and the train crews and the passengers themselves, we have not come close to running out of angles and photo subjects. Early one morning, as we waited by the S-curve across from the church, two little girls came out of their house and headed down the sidewalk towards us, on their way to the bus stop to go to school. What you doing? one of them asked. We're waiting for the trains to take pictures of them, I said. This made just little enough sense to her that she stared at me for a long moment before walking on. That evening, George and I walked up to a house on the next corner to ask if we could stand on their porch the next morning to photograph the trains. We got to meet most of the family, the father, his school-aged daughters, and their cat, named Butters. The father told us that the railroad has plans to add a second track through Michigan City, and they might buy his house to knock it down to expand the right-of-way, but he did not know yet how much money they would offer him. If and when that project happens, it will fundamentally alter the look and feel of the entire neighborhood, not for the better, in my opinion. How many more opportunities will we have to photograph 11th Street before the wrecking ball arrives? Later that same Monday evening, the last westbound of the day has gone, and the eastbound rush had likewise ended, although four more trains would come from Chicago before the schedule rolled over to Tuesday. A lone man sat in the shelter at the 11th Street station. As I walked by on the way to our rented car, he asked if I had any money I could spare. Not carrying any, I told him, truthfully. Man, I don't know where I'm going to go, he said. I got kicked out of the shelter for fighting, and I ain't got nowhere. He hadn't looked at me since first speaking. I stood there dumbly. He looked up at me and he said, I'm having a bad day. Up from the ashes? Few cities so closely identified by a single industry have so successfully remade themselves, transitioning from the grittiest steel to the cleanest medical technology. Pittsburgh could well have been a poster child for post-industrial Pennsylvania. Today, one is hard-pressed to find a trace of Pittsburgh's steel industry. Located at the confluence of three major rivers, Pittsburgh is a city of bridges, both road and rail. By far the most impressive railroad bridge and an object of our attention is the Pensees Ohio Connecting Bridge, 4,548 feet in length, built in 1915. In our search for different angles on the OC Bridge, we have seen it from all sides, touring a good portion of the Ohio River Valley, 
meeting property owners along the way who gave us permission to come not only onto their land, but also into their homes. In an example of serendipity, we were looking for an east bank view of the OC Bridge when we came, when we came across a pair of new blue shoes discarded on the street, which led to a conversation with Marsha at a nearby house, which then led to our being invited in for a unique second floor view of the bridge, which then led us to an introduction to our 42-pound cat, Thomas Edison. The blue shoes remained on the street, waiting to be paired with some sharp dresser. The rotunda of Pennsylvania Station is unique, and we're unaware of anything that can match it. The station building has been repurposed as apartments and is now named the Pennsylvanian. On a Sunday, we went to the Polish Hill neighborhood to photograph a ghost sign advertising Mother's Bread, and as one thing leads to another, we found ourselves in the organ loft of the Immaculate Heart of Mary Church, a magnificent sanctuary with a diminished congregation. In Homestead, on the former site of U.S. Steel's huge Homestead Mill, there remained but 12 tall red brick smokestacks sitting incongruously in the parking lot of a shopping mall, but we're thankful for the foresight that preserved them. We have now been to Pittsburgh four times, and it continues to intrigue us, not only for its railroads, but also for its distinctive neighborhoods. It's another one of those places to which we went for the trains, but were charmed by its architecture. As a kid and young adult, and even not so young adult, I hardly ever photographed people. Here and there I aimed my camera at an engineer or someone else on a steam train, but I certainly would not include anyone who did not belong in a train photo, like a passerby or another rail fan. I can't honestly say what changed my outlook on that, but a dozen years away from serious photography helped, taking a thousand rolls of snapshots of our children, and the rise of social media has vastly increased the number of rail fans I keep in touch with and consider my friends, and now I like to document the people I spend time with at trackside. And as my outlook about the railroad environment has changed, influenced by George and many others, it has become important to take pictures of the people I meet along the way, some of them at trackside, many of them not. On the 10,000 miles or so of our CRPA trips, we have spent enough time in each of a few dozen towns and cities to have gotten to talk to some of the residents. And we have, to use a cliched phrase, but one that still has honest meaning, come closer to America. In Frankfort, Indiana, an elderly woman walking her dog told me about coming to live in town decades earlier after she got married. Her husband had worked at the manufacturing plant still in business across the tracks from the nickel plate coal dock. It took me a while to make out that she had a dog named Baby. With her southern Indiana accent, it sounded like BB, but the light bulb came on for me before I asked her if she had named the dog after the great railroad photographer. In the Clinton County Courthouse in Frankfurt, I talked with two poll workers set up to register voters and record their ballots during the spring primary of 2018. Although Indiana votes bright red, it has early voting for a week before every election, and Clinton County's 32,000 people have their choice of seven locations and any one of them with proper ID can show up and register and vote right there. I wish Pennsylvania could do as well. In the tax office, Susie Plunkett told me about her son, who took Japanese language lessons during high school, went off to Purdue to study East Asian culture and Japanese language, and came home to Frankfurt, a very small city in the rural Midwest, and got a good-paying job with a company that supplies locally made parts to the Subaru assembly plant a dozen miles away in Lafayette. At work, he speaks Japanese with his colleagues half a world away, an excellent example of the benefits of globalization in the heartland. Nowhere have George and I had more uplifting interactions with complete strangers than in Braddock and East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, towns as rusty as any in the Rust Belt. Braddock has America's first Carnegie Library, dedicated in 1889 by Andy Carnegie himself. The huge Edgar Thompson works, with Pennsylvania's last blast furnaces, sits half a mile away. On our first visit to the city, 
which has lost 90% of its population since the peak almost exactly a century ago, we stumbled onto the library in the mostly vacant downtown, and the children's librarian gave us an impromptu tour of the building, including of the 900-seat theater now undergoing renovation. In 1974, the library had closed, and it sat abandoned and vandalized for almost 10 years, but a group of citizens bought it for a dollar and have spent four decades bringing it back to life. The last few pictures here show the kids we met on two days a year and a half apart. Right across the street from the library, as we gawked at the beautiful former post office, now apartments, a group of boys blowing down the street surrounded us, fascinated by these camera-toting outlanders. Hey, man, take my picture. Hey, man, can I try that camera? We didn't have time to get their names before they blew away again, so I could not send them any of the pictures they made. The boys who came out onto the near-empty Westinghouse Bridge on another Sunday had the same reaction to us. Hey, man, take my picture. I did, and I gave each of them my card. One of the boys, Eric, wrote to me, and I emailed him the pictures. When George and I walked off the bridge into the setting sun that evening, we found another group of kids sitting under the no loitering sign right next to our car at the Mini Mart. George could not forbear giving them a hard time about their law breaking, and he also asked their names. He could not figure them out. Janiah at the right, then TT. CC, he said. No, TT. GG? And everyone started laughing. I gave them each my card too, and Janiah emailed me the next day, so she and her friends have copies of these photos too. I love this last picture because it shows happiness and demonstrates the human connection that even complete strangers can make in no time at all. These trips all started because of pictures of trains, and look where they have taken us.